the remains of what used to be a four-bedroom soldier settler house. It's still pretty strange. Uh, it's like a bizarre dream. This was an outside laundry area. The toilet over there. Um, the front foyer area that went into all the kitchen and living room. Wayne Lewis is one of many kangaroo islanders who lost almost everything. In molten alloy that in the worst bushfires to strike Australia in living memory. It really didn't spare anything. All morning I kept going up to the corner, uh, double checking where the fire was. And um, once I saw it drop onto Church Road and I could hear the noise of the thing, it was the time, that was time to go. I think any, any longer we, we would not have got out. I don't think be riding that one anytime soon. All my motorbikes. Um, all my spare cars. Um, my whole four bedroom house was full of heirlooms that were more than 100 years old, a lot of them. Um, unfortunately, you can't get that stuff back. Uh, you know, so many people asked me if you had insurance, uh, which I didn't, but I mean, insurance wouldn't bring that back anyway. Melted. And all the stories you hear are just as devastating. Like I said, out of everybody, I, you know, I didn't lose the most, but, you know, Having lost that amount to anybody is, you know, more than enough. I don't think I'll ever be used to seeing it like this. Wayne managed to tow a small caravan away from the fire. For others, the inferno took everything. A father and son were also tragically trapped in their car as they sought safety. Right here is where the poor guys got burned to death. You can see they were that disorientated, they were going all over the road. And that was where they ended up. There's an extreme shortage of houses on Kangaroo Island for rent. I've been quite fortunate to still have anything left out of the fires. Um, you know, having the caravans very uh, handy. Um, most people lost cars, everything, uh, just got out with their lives. The fire that took Wayne Tome also nearly caught up with his refuge. So the fires, they happened just across the road here and somehow they missed this property. They've gone straight down through two other farms, just missing the houses, um, and then jumped back over the road onto this side and continued on through the island. Homes and farms were destroyed along with much of the South Australian island's unique habitat, which some have called an ecological wonderland. Imported species like European rabbits and foxes have long wreaked havoc across mainland Australia, but were never introduced here and are now forbidden. Kangaroo Island used to be my home, and I used to come to this beach almost every day where I would see things like stingrays, pied oyster eaters, pelicans, there's one back there in the distance right now, and even the occasional sea lion, all part of the abundant wildlife that makes this island so famous, not just in South Australia, but right across the country. While much of the coastal wildlife was spared, animals trapped inland like kangaroos and this koala mother and her child had little chance. When you look at the map of the fire ground, you're looking at 80% of the koala habitat has been burnt, um, and, and most of the koalas would have perished with it. But it's not just koalas, kangaroos, wallabies, echidnas, possums, you know, many different bird species, reptiles, they've all gone with it. Um, and, and we've got no idea how many tens of thousands that might be, or hundreds of thousands. Sam Mitchell owns this private wildlife park that has become Kangaroo Island's unofficial animal shelter. Originally cable tied these together. We had no roads to access any building materials, so we're working with what we, what we had. So we whipped a few of these up and then just around the corner here, we've been building some more permanent structures. So this building here we put in, it's transportable to operate from as the, the hospital. 
Even the army is now helping to build enclosures. The first few weeks we were seeing a lot of burn victims come through and now those guys that suffered injuries in the, in the fires that didn't die, infections taken over, the wounds are, are pretty severe. Um, so the next wave of animals that we're seeing now that we have a chance of saving are those that have no feed. So there's a lot of koalas still out there up the trees. There's no food in those trees. So soon they'll be dying of starvation and dehydration. So the next phase is to get out there and catch as many as those and get them into safety. Koalas are not native to the island and until the fires were considered a pest. Animal rescue efforts haven't entirely been without controversy, with some locals on the island complaining too much effort and money is being spent rescuing animals instead of helping farmers and people who lost their homes. So many people have been devastated and then you focus on animals and people question why the animals before the people and that is a really hard one to answer because I mean, what I do and what I've always done is saved injured animals. I've been doing it for the seven years I'm here, and, and when they show up at my door, I'm going to save them, but I wish I could do more for everyone else. Good luck, little buddy. Yeah, yeah you're in the, the best, best care. Looking after the animals is a huge challenge, yeah. as is what to do with them when they're ready for release. For the animals that have been brought into care and are being rehabilitated, the challenge will be to find unburned areas where the animals can be returned. And that may not be as easy as it sounds, simply because any unburned habitat is likely to be already full of the species that are being returned. And if you try to return animals to burned areas that are in the process of regeneration, you have to be really sure that the regeneration is at a stage where the animals will find enough resources. Wildlife is a big drawcard for the roughly 200,000 holidaymakers who visit each year making tourism one of the biggest economic drivers on Kangaroo Island, along with traditional farming and thriving boutique industries like honey. A lot less bees in here than there was, but there's still some. We've lost uh, about four to 500 of our 1,200 hives, um, and we, we won't be able to build up our numbers again for quite a few years. The biggest impact it's had on my operation is that uh, We've lost the vegetation off more than half of Kangaroo Island at the western end where we got a lot of uh, honey from uh, summer and autumn. Uh, we've never had a fire of this uh, scale or intensity on Kangaroo Island before. So uh, we've never had suffered the losses that we have in this last uh, period and um, we hope never to again. The fires have prompted an intense debate about how to mitigate another natural disaster that is likely, even if global efforts to slow climate change succeed. One idea getting a lot of attention is the reintroduction of a technique used for up to 65,000 years before European colonizers arrived. Indigenous Australians burned off dead wood and undergrowth, known today as the fuel load, in small patches during the winter months. It's been demonstrated, I guess, over millennia, particularly by cultural burning, is that by burning during the cool period of the year, you can reduce fuel loads. If you do it in a mosaic fashion, you can break up big fires and reduce the tendency of big fires to take hold over large areas. So I think that'll be an important part of the, the overall toolkit to be used in the future. The big fires are out, but the cleanup continues. Our main task has been um, what we call mopping up and looking for hot spots along the burnt edge. So where the fire's already been, um, we go out to, to tasked locations um, and we drive and walk through that fire uh, edge, so between the unburnt and the burnt ground, um, and check for yeah what we call hot spots. We look for holes in the ground or tree stumps. Uh, we might touch with the back of our hand or we've got some technology to pick up whether they're still warm. 
Um, some spots are still smoking a bit. A uh, few spots have still had actual flame. And so when we locate um, a hot spot, we deal with it, whether that's with um, tools or with water. The National Parks Agency is just one of many working under the wing of Australia's country fire services. About 600 emergency workers, including 400 country fire service volunteers, fought the fires at their height. Australia's army was even mobilised domestically at a national level for the first time during the fires. On Kangaroo Island, the army is just one of the organisations providing meals at the main staging area, hastily evacuated to the east coast in January when it became clear the land it was on would also be consumed by the blaze. Under very extreme weather conditions, uh, exceptionally hot temperature, well over 40 degrees on the ground with strong northerly winds, fires moved from the western end of Kangaroo Island right the way to the east. Now as the fires are um, moving to more of a controlled space, there's still 400 people on the island that are working now to help rehabilitate the community and help people get back to a sense of normality. They're not only just emergency services, but lots of health workers, lots of mental health agencies, people to help rebuild fences, to help people rebuild their homes, to bring in stock, to bring in feed and those type of things. The various fire services spread across the rural areas of Australia are unique. The largest force in the world made up almost entirely of volunteers. Volunteers give up as much time as they can. Some will donate 30 or 40 hours a week to being volunteers. Others might only have two or three hours. But when an emergency happens, they stop whatever they're doing, get on the back of fire trucks and go and help their neighbours. Most people here say the best way for people to help Kangaroo Island in the short term is to visit, spend money and help the local community. That's also the message coming from the national parks and fire services which have been holding outreach sessions with the community and tourists still visiting the northeast shore of the island that was mostly spared. Kangaroo Island is open for business. I think that's probably the, the biggest um, key to get the, the community uh, back on track is that people can still come here. There's plenty of beautiful scenery, uh, wildlife, vegetation to see. Uh, there's still plenty of the tourist um, opportunities for people to come and um, enjoy. Open for business, but like many other parts of Australia, years away from a full recovery, coupled to the risk of similar fires in the years ahead. Jack Barton on Kangaroo Island for Assignment Asia.